evening, everybody. Welcome to this panel discussion. I'll be introducing my fellow panelists in a bit, uh, but I'd, on behalf of the American Embassy, uh, the Chargé d'Affaires here in Singapore, um, Rafiq Mansour has a recorded welcome. Good evening. I am Rafiq Mansour, Chargé d'Affaires of the US Embassy in Singapore. Thank you for joining us for this important discussion of diversity in the arts. We hope you enjoyed our exclusive screening of Hamilton, an American musical. We would like to thank our partners at Disney for making this very special opportunity available to us here in Singapore. Disney is one of more than 4,500 American companies operating in Singapore, bringing creativity and innovation to the region, employing Singaporeans in cutting edge careers and giving back to their communities. The award-winning Hamilton has inspired thousands in the United States and around the world, inviting viewers to rethink their perceptions of American history and the country we have become since our founding fathers paved the way. The show's writer and star, Lin-Manuel Miranda, has said that Hamilton's cast looks like America looks now providing a contemporary take on important events that helped shape American democracy and society. This perspective is especially meaningful to us as Americans as we recently celebrated Independence Day this year, commemorating 244 years since our Declaration of Independence was adopted. Over those years, the United States has grown, evolved, and adapted as we continue to do during the public discourse currently happening in our country around racial equality. America is stronger because of its diversity. This is just one of the many shared values we have in common with Singapore. Both our nations are made up of a vibrant blend of people from different backgrounds and experiences that enrich our societies. One of the most important places we can see that diversity reflected is in the arts, which is why I am pleased we are able to have this discussion this evening. I would like to thank our panelists for sharing their insights on the film and the important topic of diversity in the arts. Tonight's discussion will be moderated by Professor Michael Early, Dean of the Faculty of Performing Arts at LaSalle College of the Arts. He is joined by panelists Adrian and Tracy Pang from Pangdemonium, and Natalie Hennedegay from the Singapore International Festival of Arts. I hope you enjoy the discussion. Thank you, Rafiq. Rafiq Mansour, uh, I guess you could say uh, the, the American Embassy, of course, is the sponsor of this uh, panel tonight, but it worked with Disney Plus to bring Hamilton to Singapore. Uh, Disney Plus is not broadcasting in Singapore at the moment, so this special screening that I hope many of you were able to see over this past few days through the 4th of July weekend and the early part of this week. Um, we really do thank them for this. So this is the reason for it. Uh, as uh, Rafik said, my name is Michael Early. I'm Dean of Performing Arts at LaSalle College of the Art. And I'm joined tonight by Natalie Hennigay, uh, who is the artistic director of Cake Theater here in Singapore, one of our really fantastic experimental companies. She's also, I guess we should say, festival director designate for the Singapore International Festival of the Arts, and she'll take up her role over this coming year and, and start beginning programming for 21-22. Also joining us are Tracy Pang and Adrian Pang, who are joint artistic directors of Pangdemonium, uh, a company which started in Singapore about 10 years ago and have had 10 very successful years, all done with a lot of hard work. Uh, Adrian, you'll know as a great actor, Tracy as a great director. So they're gonna be joining me in this discussion tonight about the importance of diversity in the performing arts. We're gonna look at that topic both locally, obviously reflecting on Singapore, but we're gonna be looking at it also internationally and in a much broader context and not thinking of it just in our own terms here in Singapore. Uh, we're gonna be looking at it from the point of view largely of theater, although where we can, we'll certainly mention it in the other art forms. But as most of us, or all of us really in this case, are theater artists, we'll probably be concentrating on 
on the theater. First, uh, just a quick bit out of the way about Hamilton, because we're really not going to talk about Hamilton, from, perhaps refer to it from time to time. This is not a discussion of the production you've seen. This is really a discussion about a much more serious topic, diversity. But Hamilton, um, which many of you have seen, has been a huge, huge success, uh, starting in America in January of 2015 at the Downtown Public Theater and quickly, very quickly moving to Broadway that same year. It had a $30 million advance ticket sale before it started on Broadway. The show has made over 500 million US dollars. And the production you saw, the Disney Plus production, was sold to Disney Plus for 75 million. So Alexander Hamilton, who was America's first Secretary of the Treasury, would be very happy because it was Hamilton who predicted really the financial stability of America. And that is why his picture is on the $10 bill in America, and it still is. But that's mentioned in the play, as you know. So uh, it's, uh, uh, we have Hamilton to thank for some of the good things, but also some of the less good things about the American economy. Although Hamilton has been a huge success um, and going into this weekend was riding on those laurels, we have to also mention that there has been a quite serious cancel Hamilton activities going on since Disney Plus released the film. Uh, lots of concerns and lots of quarters that the production or the play, musical in this case, does not accurately reflect Black Lives Now. And with so much happening in America now in 2020, it's a slightly different instance for the musical than it was in 2015 when it was lauded by no less than President Barack Obama who brought the entire cast to the White House to perform. And the charges against it really stem from the fact that it doesn't really go into the factors of, of black oppression in America, even during that time, nor does it really talk about slavery. And many of the founding fathers of the American nation, uh, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, uh, Hamilton's own in-laws, the Schuyler family, the Schuyler sisters who were in the play, uh, were slave owners. And also the way in which it plays at some points in the production fast and loose with history. So we just mentioned that so that we're putting everything in a proper context. Uh, the play, nonetheless, and the production, nonetheless, has paved new ways for diversity in acting. And the so-called colorblind casting, which itself is highly problematic, um, led to a whole group of new performers entering the American theater. And many of those performers who you've seen in this production are now household names in America and have gone on to really stunning careers. So it changed the face of American musicals and the use of hip hop really moves the story along in the use of rhythm and blues, but it quotes about 15 other American musicals and musical styles. So it's just not a hip hop musical. It's a very sophisticated storytelling through musical sung all the way through. There are very few moments when it just stops for dialogue. So it's a thrilling production and we mustn't lose sight of that fact as well. So I wanted to really start by turning to my panelists and we really wanted to look at this idea of diversity in the arts. And Natalie, I wonder if we could start with you by just really looking at it on an international level. You'll be taking on the reins of a major international festival where you want to obviously reflect diversity in all kinds of ways. How do you respond to this idea? I think it's, um... It's important to, to look at what an international arts festival um, means um, for the time in which we're uh, living in. That's what festivals do. Um, they are living things, you know, and they, and, and a festival enters uh, a communal home in, in some ways. And, and the festival needs to ask how it, enters into uh, a community. It has to ask how it, what it brings to the table, how it engages with uh, conversations of the day, 
um, how it also um, leaves um, the communal whole, so to speak, um, but with a sense of a kind of a lingering because of because uh, the conversations were authentic. Maybe they were difficult. Maybe they were um, maybe they were emotional, uh, or they. Um, but there is a sense of a, a, a lingering of the festival and, and a sort of a desire for it to then uh, return uh, again to extend the conversation. So um, for me, you know, and I, and, I, and I sort of, this year, as we know, um, with the pandemic, uh, everything's been at a, at a standstill. So I actually, you know, um, while I was meant to, to, to begin to present my first festival in 2021, that's, uh, that's taken a bit of a, a pause and, and I begin only in 2022. So uh, it's given me a lot of time actually to, to take in what um, the issues of the day or, or the problems of the day, the things that are within our control and the things that are out of our control. And uh, in some ways, it's also um, reminding me to pause uh, and, and just take in uh, the movements of the day, the complexities of the day, because they're going to shift and they shift from moment to moment, beat to beat. And, and, and so while um, suddenly I'm planning in advance, you know, um, and there's so much you can do to put a festival together, part of what I'm required to do is actually to just uh, this difficult thing of, of, of just sitting still and, and deeply listening to um, what's going on and, and, and also to, to, to sort of surrender to um, this grave moment, right, uh, that affects all of us. Um, what I think that an international arts festival needs to do, every international arts festival needs to do, it needs to be a, it needs to be a space for multiplicity. Um, and it needs to be a space where there is a sharing of unique perspectives. It's a space where um, unique perspectives can articulate. That's what we're creating, right? Um, but it, it's also a space of, of, of deep listening. Um, it's a space for us to um, turn down our own volume sometimes and to listen to another's perspective. And um, that's what I think, just, in, just briefly, that I think that this festival uh, needs to be. Uh, it needs to reflect um, not just the space it occupies in, 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 in Singapore uh, with all the complexities and all the layers and the nuances that our city uh, echoes, but it also needs to then from this space also um, echo uh, what's, reflect what's going on regionally and, and, then, and then sending ripples internationally. That's what an international arts festival is about. I'll, I'll, I guess I'll pause there. Yeah, and thanks very much. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to you. Thanks. And be, before I turn to uh, Tracy and, and also Adrian, I just wanted to mention that uh, we've turned off the chat facility on the screen, but the question and answer facility is on, and we hope you'll write in any questions. We'll, we'll turn to questions at the very end of the discussion. But I also wanted to mention that at a few times tonight during, during our talk, um, we're going to um, use a, what's called a Mentimeter, which is a way for you to uh, poll responses. And there's two links to it. Uh, one is to click on the link in Zoom for it. And the other is to use a separate device, as you can see on the screen, by going to www.menti.com and dial in this code 200303. And we are just taking an informal poll from the audience watching tonight, and we'll give you the results of these polls as we go along this evening. Um, 
and they won't be shared right away, but it'll take a minute or so to get a critical mass. So I think, are we ready to go with the first poll? Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Okay, so if you can get on the poll and want to take it quickly, the link is up in the chat area. Just have to tap on the link and go to it and then come right back to our screen. Okay, we'll let you do that. And while you're doing that, we don't want to hold up our chat, but I'd like to go on uh, quickly if I can. Tracy, can I turn to you? Um, obviously, you're a company that um, is unabashed at taking on issues, um, diversity clearly in lots of different forms. Um, because diversity can be widely defined. It's, it's not only uh, 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 along the racial divides, but it's also along the uh, religious divides. It's also about abilities and disabilities. It's also about what happens in domestic circumstances. How does pandemonium fit diversity into their own work? Um. I mean, I think it's very important for us to make sure that we are telling stories from um, different minority groups. So, you know, whether that be, um, you know, uh, a, a racial issue or whether it is something that is about a disability, um, it, it's giving us a chance to, or our audience a chance to, to kind of tune out to their own stories for a minute and empathize with the, with the, the one story, to, to actually del delve into that story, listen and hear it, and, you know, walk few steps in, in those shoes. And I think that's always been important to us to, um, to highlight these kind of uh, very little known stories um, and realize actually that, that they're much greater than we, we take for granted for. Um, it, it, it is important to us um, to uh, encompass the whole. You know, we are a community. It's not just about the one person. And, and I think, you know, kind of, I suppose, you know, going back to what theater traditionally is in our topic of diversity, um, you know, theater is often populated by male, white, middle class, you know, that is the, the kind of the traditional look on it. Um, and we find it really important to go beyond that. Um, you know, it, you know th theater is um, a mirror, you know, as often said. And, and if it is a mirror, then, then we need to be looking at very different parts of society and, and throwing up a mirror to that too. I think it's really, really important. Um, and, and, you know, and that, that goes back to, you know, um, diversity in, in, in all avenues. So, you know, if, if we only ever get to see a racial minority as a gang member or a servant, then what kind of reflection are we telling these new young people that, that are being introduced to these stories? And, and I suppose on top of that, you know, it's society in general, they only ever see that group of people in those circumstances. So we actually find that it's really important to try to tell a, a, a group, you know, a whole load of different stories to open our eyes to people's different stories. Um, I think that's part and parcel of what our mission is at Pangemonium um, in, in, you know, opening our awareness to a greater group of the, of, of the community. Yeah, great. Adrian, I mean, when, when, it, when you choose, and you have a wide variety of plays, I must say, uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the, the predominantly uh, modern plays, very contemporary plays that either you've commissioned or plays that you've, you've seen in other parts of the world and bring the, is there, a, is there a choice in that where you're looking for plays, not only a diverse range of plays, but, a, but a re plays that reflect different communities? I think, um... At the heart of it, when, when we come to programming our seasons or choosing the productions that we do, um, it's got to be a good story. At the heart of it, uh, we're a theatre company that tells stories on stage, and um, so we just want to choose the best stories that we can find. And what 
what is a good story? I mean, certainly um, for Tracy and myself, we, we instinctively gravitate towards the kind of theater that we ourselves want to go and experience. Uh, that we ourselves want to go and watch and, and learn from and be, and be moved by as an audience. And so by default, that's the kind of theater that we want to make as well. And we have found uh, in the 10 years that uh, we've been creating Pandemonium um, that the kinds of stories that we gravitate towards um, are stories that make us feel a little uncomfortable, that make us uh, force ourselves to question one another and question ourselves and to enter into, into heated debates about. Um, and and we, we, we find that oftentimes that these are stories that happen to, happen to deal with issues that affect us all as a community. And, and we have found that it's become our, our mission. It wasn't ever really something we, we consciously decided, but then we've kind of evolved into this place now where we, it, it, it is now part of our mission to tell stories that, that highlight issues um, that marginalized communities are struggling with, you know, issues which uh, the majority of us are you know, perhaps blissfully unaware of or indifferent to. And we want to ask uncomfortable questions with our, with our work, you know, questions to which we don't necessarily have the answers to, but we want to engage our audiences in, in meaningful dialogues with and to examine our differences and our, our preconceived ideas, our prejudices, and try to hopefully work through them collectively. I mean, as Tracy says, yes, theater is a mirror to society, but, but also I think it's, it's a, well, it's a, it's a microscope really forcing us to and enabling us to see things that we wouldn't ordinarily be able to see. So that's, yeah. what, that's what we think um, theater should be for us. Sure, and the, the, the all importance of story. I, I, we know that Len Manuel Miranda uh, got the idea for Hamilton when he went on a holiday after, after finishing a run of his first great hit with In the Heights. And he bought a book at the airport before leaving. Uh, and it was Ron Chernow's 800 plus page biography of Alexander Hamilton. And he will say again and again, it was the story that captivated him. Uh, before we move on, I just want to read our, our Mentimeter results from the first Mentimeter are up and we're going to show them right now. Oh my God, look at that. Um, and it has to do with how do you feel about the experience of watching the Broadway musical Hamilton as a film? And an overwhelming number um, uh, said they, as much as they liked seeing the film, they were keen to see, see the stage version. And Adrian and Tracy, you saw the stage version in London, you said, and you're now keen to see the stage version again after seeing the film, how it just opened up more and more for you about the, about about that and tell us a, but in combination with that tell us about how you're missing live theater full stop oh, oh we could be here all night <laughs> okay then we won't go that way <laughs> um you know i mean like you said i mean we saw the film we we, we watched it uh the the play um in london um watching it again it was it was able to um highlight to us things that we couldn't see watching it when we saw it live. Um, but it made me want to go back and watch it again. That kind of energy that you see, it's so infectious that I want to be in the room with it, you know? Um, it, it, it's really in the room important. where it happens. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I guess that's what I miss about live performance. You know, that electric energy that you have sitting in the room and you're experiencing it with maybe 500 other people at the same time um you know and the emotions that wash over you when you're experiencing something live it's, it's very very different it's a, such a different medium 
um, that, you know, I, you know, at the moment I almost feel like I, I have an arm that's been cut off, you know, that, and, um, it, it, it's a horrible feeling. It is a horrible feeling. And, and, uh, we are trying to get by, um, you know, uh, creating, trying to create work, um, that will get us through this period. And we're learning how to use new technology. Um, and it, it is a, a way forward for us, I think. It is a way forward for us to embrace this new t technology. I think there's no getting away from it. Okay. Um, but I don't want to be leaving, away, leaving behind us live theater either. So, you know, it's whether or not we just go back to live theater or whether this embracing of new technology is informative on how we move forward will be, you know, interesting to see how theater uh, uh, changes as we, you know, go beyond this Well, I, I, I asked you that question because, uh, uh, although we promised not to talk deeply about Hamilton nor about uh, what the pandemic has done to theater, I wonder uh, if from your answer, Tracy, and, and turning to Natalie, I mean, do you think this will bring new diverse means of making theater? what we've been through, because diversity also covers the modes in which we do theater. We talk about this new electronic theater we're all forced to do, but do you think it will change? Do you see, for instance, as, a, as an oncoming festival director and as someone who runs a really exciting theater company, that there'll be a new diverse kind of theater that comes out of this time? I think, I think all of us, I think we know that, that, that great creativity um, stems from, from darkness. I think it's just um, songs and paintings and, and uh, poetry um, has emerged from, 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 from dark places. I mean, if, even if we look at, at some of the, the founding festivals of the 20th century, like um, the Edinburgh Festival, you know, that came out of, of, of the war, having to, to heal. And, and there is a way as vessels of stories, you know, echoing what um, precisely what uh, Tracy and, and, and Adrian are, are talking about, we're vessels of stories and, and we're made and each person is made out of multiple stories and very difficult stories, I think, uh, within, within our lived experience and our lived experiences are so specific and so unique and even within uh within our own cultures or heritage even that um there are differences and i i find that that's that's essentially that's what art exists for um it exists because as a as a race as a human race we are working through um grave things and and this is one grave thing uh, out of many great things that have come before, um, and 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 it's proof. Um, the arts uh, essentially, artists essentially um, make, and we can't uh, stop communicating. And 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 it's proven. You know, um, we're figuring out the digital space and. And I think it's important to be um, to be kind to each other in terms of how we create it because it's because the the pandemic has forced us to to in a sense discover how to make so you've got ideas we we have ideas and then many of us are skilled in a sudden we're skilled in acting and we, we've practiced the craft of acting over many years those of us who are writers we've we've practiced the skill of writing over many years but suddenly we have to find a certain kind of skill. Uh, how do you, how do you um, communicate art in this digital medium? And I think we're at the beginning. I think it's forcing us to to refine that because it 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 just like you can tell what's art from anything else because art has a specific language. There's something that tells you that this is that art is art because of its because of the vocabulary of art, which is unique to any other. Uh, vocabulary. It's it's unique to journalistic speak. It's unique to um, um, anything else, right? And I think we're discovering how to do that. And I think we we will take. I think that that's what we're we're learning to do. And we haven't stopped. It. We've been so prolific. And I think uh, that's what our artists do. 
And I think that's how we contribute and we, we, we can't stop. We're, we're not wired to sit back. Uh, um, at most, we, 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 we pause because of, of the weight of, of what we're facing, but then we know that to, to breathe it, uh, means to, to do something and to make something and to, to move uh, uh, through in a kind of an expression. So certainly, I think that uh, post this world would have changed completely. Uh, we would have emerged from it and we would be, we would be entering as this sort of cloud um, lifts over us. Uh, we would have gone through something. We would all be bearing some kinds of added wounds. We all exist with wounds. And, and the pandemic is another kind of a wound that, that will take time to, that we will live with. You know, and that we, uh, as you know, wounds teach us that we, we, we grow from things. And I think that we will be creating. We're learning how to create um, more effectively, how to, how to refine uh, this uh, communication via digital means. And, and there's this a long ways to go. And I think it will continue to, to develop. We'll continue to learn how to, to do this um, post-COVID, you know, and, uh, and then we'll find new ways of articulating um, and bring in the old, that's what it is. It's just this evolution and this growing um, ways in which we all connect with each other and communicate um, and, and refine our communication and develop our communication. Michael, can I, can I just quickly jo uh, just, just jump in? Go ahead, there. Adrian, do come in, come quickly. Yeah, yeah actually, um, I, I, I love what, um, how, how Natalie has just put it um, and that your, your reference to wounds. I mean, this pandemic has 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 wounded the arts community um, beyond anything any of us could have imagined. I mean, we're, we're all hurting, we're all bleeding. Uh, and this is hardly a sob story um, because you ask anybody who's been making um, this a livelihood for, for all of their working lives, this, this has been obliberating entire livelihoods. Um, and yes, I mean, we've been consuming a lot of digitalized theater over the last three months. Uh, and yes, as much as I've, I've appreciated and enjoyed uh, um, much of it, some of it, uh, um, Hamilton included, I have to say it's made me miss theater all the more. And as a theater community, I think, speaking not just for Pandemonium, but every theater company, in Singapore, we, while we're hurting, we're not just sticking our, neck, our heads in the sand and hibernating and waiting for this storm to pass. We are all hard at work trying to find creative ways to keep on working. I mean, in a funny way, this, this, this virus has forced us out of our comfort zones in order to find more, yes, more diverse platforms to create our work while we're not able to to, to produce work so that people can come to us. We are now forced to explore new mediums to create work, to bring to people. And this is the way forward, and this is the way to help us grow, and I use the word again, to evolve, so that we can diversify the means by which we, we tell our stories. Then great, um, bring it on, you know. Uh, we're not gonna let this uh, defeat us. Good. Thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, we're going to go uh, next, uh, I think, a bit more uh, deeply into the whole idea of diversity. Uh, but before we do that, we wanted to put up uh, another one of our polls for uh, you out there um, and get your opinions of this before we start talking too much about diversity. But if you want to go again, uh, either click on the um, the link in the chat box or call in on another device and fill that in for us. We so appreciate it. And we'll put the results up in about five or 10 minutes. Uh, I'd like to move on um, maybe back to Natalie and then quickly back on to Adrian and Tracy uh, on this notion of diversity. I mean, we, we, our ground rules that we set for ourselves was not to really talk at all about the elections. Um, uh, but nonetheless, I couldn't help but watch some of the coverage uh, and some of the chats. Uh, and, the, and the word that keeps coming up um, is inclusion. 
which I think is probably what they mean by diversity. Uh, I also note that the Arts Council here um, in Singapore puts no pressure on companies to, um, to have uh, diversity in casting, for instance, as a mandate. I wonder if you could talk a bit about this first, Natalie, about diversity in casting. Do you think that's a major issue here? It has come up in discussions by some of our colleague companies here in Singapore, Wild Rice, The Necessary Stage. Uh, discuss it, and it's 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 part of a a movement to really bring it into the open more. Natalie, I was wondering how you view it, having run a company now for some time, and then on to Tracy and Adrian. Yeah, I think what is at the essence of inclusion is is to feel like you're authentically uh, heard that you uh, that you feel empowered in your participation so that your participation doesn't make isn't just a uh, tokenistic um, you know that that's the thing about theater right we 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 i, I remember um, walking into my, my first encounter with theater was in, in the rehearsal room and and you're just there you're you're as yourself you're there amongst um, you're in a circle you know there is this democratic circle you're standing mm -hmm. amongst people um, and and I remember you know an exercise where you, you just step into the circle and 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 the instruction was just 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 respond just just be, be anything and 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 I, I think I, I remember sort of I became a worm <laughs> but the idea I just wriggled on, on the floor because I was just going with an instinct but 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 that's the thing right I mean you, you you can step into that space and you can be a you can be anything right um, and and that space there was something that was limitless um, and it reminded me of, of what it meant to be a, a child, you know, uh, that, that you find that, that I can, you know, that, that the world is, is this place that you want to discover until you discover, until you discover. And the world will naturally, um, the world is tough and the world will, um, um, the world will tell you why you don't belong. And the world has a cruelty about it that is, as beautiful as our world is, I think we exist in a world that's dark and light. And therefore, just in the way that I believe that you poured love into a child, like, like you, uh, a young child with, you know, parents pour love into a child, as much love because, and you tell them that they're, they're great just the way they are and, and that they're beautiful just the way they are. Because the world, the, the second they, they step out of that, that, that safe uh, womb, womb or that that safe zone you know there's going to be so much that they're up against and therefore then the theater needs to be we have to remember that the that the theater needs to be a microcosm of 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 a world that we want to live in you know mm -hmm. and it's difficult because we we all have different perspectives when we when we when we make you know not all artists are the same we're all intensely different from each other and and we but we have to bring, we have to bring our honest um, perspectives respectfully into a space, right? Mm -hmm. And we have to be open to the debate because I think, as as the re the rhetoric of, of of the day is so divisive, right? Um, and I think it stems from not wanting to be in the same space as somebody who thinks differently from you. And I think that being in this space with somebody who challenges you is the only way to open that mind. It's very uncomfortable. It's painful uh, to, to be in the same room. But I think that's what, that's what the arts tells you to do, that we, we, we just have to stick it out with each other, you know, acknowledge that uh, what we hear um, might, might hurt us or might uh, anger us. Yeah. Uh, reflect on that and, and work through it. Find that dialogue. Um, and I think that that can reflect how the world can function, you know? That's, that's what we need. Um, and so mm -hmm. the, the arts needs to be that space. We have to preserve that space of dialogue, mm -hmm. of, of openness. Yeah. In Singapore, anywhere. 
Good. Adrian, Tracy, before I come to you on this, I think we have another, the Menti Media poll, um, I think has um, come back to us on audience's views. Um, oh, I'm sorry, which character did you relate to most? Oh, wow, look at that, look at that. Elizabeth Schuyler is the one they related to most. The women in the play are the ones they relate to most. Fa fascinating. It might be the makeup of the audience, who knows? But um, uh, Miranda had said again and again when, in creating this, of course, he did concentrate very uh, carefully on the women um, and they do have a voice in this production. Um, Tracy and Adrian, reflecting this, tell us about the women in your productions. Do you look, do your plays, do you do productions that seek strong female characters? Um, I think uh, it, it depends on the story, you know? I mean, I think we have, we've, we've mixed it up. We've done stories that have, have very strong male characters, but then we've also done the complete opposite as well. Um, so it, it's really about, about the nugget of the story. But yes, it is, it's very important to see strong female characters on stage. Um, you know, I think that um, looking at probably last year on, on even on Broadway, the, if you look at the percentages of named characters in shows, I think it was something like 67 to 70% are male characters. Which shows you that there's, there is, um, you know, a weightage there against strong female characters um, being shown on stage. And I think it's important to tell those stories. Um, for, for myself, um, I would say that, you know, as I was developing in this industry, a lot of people have asked me, who are your, who are your mentors? You know, who are your mentors? It's been a, quite a big question that, that I have faced, you know, in, in, in the latter years. And it's been really, really hard to actually give an answer to that. Because when I was starting out in the industry, um, I worked with a, a lot of directors and not a single time was that di director female, not once. So I never had, you know, a, a female counterpart to look up to, um, which meant that for, for a lot of us, we had to pave our own way. We didn't have those, those, those people to look up to. So I think in, in what we are doing right now, it's really important that, that we are able to create characters and, and, not, and not just through what you see on stage, but what you see happening backstage as well. So that we have a more diverse, uh, uh, skilled staff working backstage of, and diversity not just in, in, in sex, but in uh, the people who are populating the backstage. Um, I think if you look at, at your writers, you know, 85% uh, um, you know, of writers are male. So we need good female writers who are writing good female characters. 76% um, of choreographers are male. So, so we need that diversity to, to go beyond just what we see on stage, but to, to actually uh, um, you know, melt throughout the whole of the industry. And I think that that starts, you know, with uh, right from the very top. So um, in, in the boardroom, you know, in, with our leaders, it's got to start there and it's got to work its way down so that, that the young people coming into this industry can see that there is a route for them you know, that it goes, it goes beyond just what we're seeing on stage, I think. Yeah, and we, uh, we see it certainly in the, in the university and art school sector, the greater preponderance of, of, of women studying the arts uh, than men. Uh, I mean, we have to say one of the sad factors about Hamilton, of course, is it's an all-male creative team, a white creative team, too. <laughs> Uh, so uh, that's one of the uh, other things that uh, has been noted about the show from time to time. Uh, Natalie, before I come back to you, we have, I think, one final uh, uh, poll that we're going to put up. 
Um, and then we're going to go right from that poll. We're getting some fantastic question and answers, probably better question and answers than I'm posing. So I think we're gonna start with one of those. So there's your final poll, which we'll uh, show on the screen after we've taken question and answers. So once we're ready for the first question, uh, maybe we can show that poll. One question that came up, which I'd like to ask you, because of course I run a drama school and uh, we're in the business of training actors and performers and getting them work. Somebody asked a very good question, I think, about uh, the idea of privilege. Uh, do you privilege people who've been trained, who've been training as actors since they were kids, let's say, brought up? Or do you look at raw talent to get a, an interesting diversity? What do you look for when you're casting? And how does diversity operate in your casting processes? Uh, Adrian, maybe you could take that on. If you're casting about what, about uh, up to eight productions a year, I think? <laughs> so you're trying to kill us. <laughs> yeah, well, six, but six big ones, but then lots of. Well, um, um... Auditions, I mean, just, just ca casting can be, can be very exciting. It can be excruciating as well. Sure. I mean, when, when you're trying to audition for any, any production, um, there is a, a sense of anticipation because, I mean, certainly for us, we're always on the lookout for new blood. Um, we want to work with different people. And it's always so such a thrill to be able to, to discover someone we've never worked with before, um, whether they're a... Uh, uh, a 10-year-old, whether they're a 65-year-old. Um, um, there's, there's something to be said for a lived life, that authenticity that cannot be replicated from someone having just lived a full, complex life that they can then invest into their performance and their, their characterizations, uh, which perhaps no drama school training can imbue uh, a, a student. And it, it's just a matter of really for us, you know, when we're, when we're casting, um, wanting each person who comes to the audition to be good. We're not, you know, as, as the auditioners, we're never there to just want to pull apart, you know, someone's uh, uh, presentation of their audition. We always hope and pray that they are the next big discovery for us uh, and for the theatre community. Um, I think that, 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 you know, people who have come through training, they, they bring different skills with them. They have different skill sets which are learned. Um, you know, and that, that is something that, 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 that is brought on board that I know that if I see somebody who's a diamond in the rough and I think, wow, that person is perfect for it, I know then that there are certain skills that I may have to work with them on you know because they haven't had that training doesn't necessarily mean that they're not right for the job because yeah. at the end of the day when we're auditioning you know we want the best person for the job so that's always really important um i think part of our auditioning process and part and part of the journey that we take as pandemonium has always been to as adrian was saying look for new blood i think it's it's really important that if we want to have a more diverse uh, um, acting uh, uh, community here, that we are seeing new people on stage. It's the only way that, that the community is gonna grow and it will become more diverse. So, you know, it is important to us to continue to keep seeing people, whether they have come through a background of training or not. Yeah, very good. Natalie, did you want to jump in with any response? We have I think more. There is, yeah, sure. No, I, I mean, I, I, I echo a lot of what uh, uh, Tracy and Adrian are saying. There is something, though, about uh, a commitment to, to craft uh, that I value. I think when you, I think it's, it's, it's always such a, I remember how frightening it was, you know, to, uh, to kind of decide to take on this path. And then, and then the fear also of graduating and then, um, and then not knowing where that was going to um, go, where, you know, how I was going to support myself. But I, I, I have a, 
I have a, I think there is something to be said about um, committing to the, the marathon of, 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 of the craft, whatever your craft is, and um, going through sort of the, the seasons of um, wilderness, I would say. There's so much in, 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 in our pathways in the arts that, that is walking through great wilderness. Uh, a lot of it requires us to um, be two things, you know, be in collaboration, deep collaboration with, with people, which is an intensely difficult thing to do. And also to be um, very quiet and reflective and, and, and by ourselves, which is also a very difficult thing to do. Um, so I think people, so I think um, the path of, 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 a, of a performing arts student is, is, is one that, is, that, that comes with a lot of um, bravery, I think, and, and uh, it shows a kind of a conviction and, and, uh, and it's a tough path and it's a difficult, it's a difficult uh, industry to, yeah. to get through. So I do, I do have a great deal of respect for, for people who make the choice to enter into a, a life in the arts uh, and to stick it through. Uh, and we only hope that, that we, we all get through um, because um, it takes a toll uh, spiritually, mentally, physically. I think a lot of people, uh, unless you're in it, don't, uh, might, not, might not perceive it so, so uh, 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 immediately, but we feel it palpably. We have had a second, another question as a, a kind of on top of that, which has to do obviously with not just race, but also gender casting against gender and across genders. Um, Hamilton made the breakthrough by casting uh, uh, black performers in basically white roles, but not even referring to it as that, obviously. But we're seeing, of course, in our own training in drama school, we're seeing a wide variety of preferences in terms of gender. Um, and we, we, of course, want to, to, to feel that we are open uh, to uh, to, to roles and casting against that, men playing women, women playing men. Has that entered into your work at this stage, Adrian, Tracy? I mean, thus, thus far, um, for the productions that we have produced uh, um, as Pangdemonium, um, we haven't encountered um, a particular play or a musical where we could cast against uh, the, the, the gender. I mean, it's something that we would absolutely be be open to should the should the opportunity ar ar arise. In fact, um, case in point, we were just watching uh, a streamed production of um, A Midsummer Night's Dream just uh, a week ago from the Bridge London, Theatre. The Bridge Theatre in London, yeah. Yeah, in, yeah. in London, where they, where they made where they they made a very very <laughs> interesting choice of. Uh, well, for convenience sake, kind of swapping, swapping the the the, the roles of uh, Oberon and Titania, uh, to hilarious effect, um, um, which when I watched it, I thought, oh my god, that is just so brilliant, and that is such an obvious ch choice. Why has no one ever thought of that before? Or certainly, in no production that I've seen of uh, Midsummer, Night, Midsummer Night's Dream, but it just worked so effectively. And not, it wasn't just as a, as a token uh, gimmick or novelty, it, it actually enhanced the storytelling. So it was very inspiring for us um, as artist characters of, of Pangemonium to see, wow, the possibilities of that kind of, of um, casting against gender uh, types Certainly for me, it made me go, wow, that is really exciting. I, I want to be able to find an opportunity to do that as well moving forward. Yeah, but you wouldn't do it with your full Monty, would you? <laughs> well, then, then IMDA will definitely have some. <laughs> we, we, did have a, we did have a question about IMDA. Is IMDA um, the body that you have to refer things to? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, I mean, they, they are the body that we have to submit all our scripts to yeah. for them to vet and to, to give us a rating on. Okay. 
Yeah, and we would never call them censors, but they are an authority of some kind. Yeah, yeah, okay. 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 okay, Natalie, there's been a lot of questions about storytelling. I mean, where would you see more diverse stories coming from? I mean, if you are looking down the line um, at a festival, where are there parts of the world that haven't told stories in Singapore or parts of the world that would tell stories that Singaporeans should learn about? Well, I think where you want to find diversity in, in storytelling is you, you need to get, um, it has to begin with, you have to find, you have to find diversity on every level. So um, you need to find diverse writers. You need to find uh, diverse uh, makers. You need to have, uh, you need to inspire sort of uh, collaborators to assemble uh, people in the room that will challenge them because of multi-perspective. And, 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 a, and a kind of a multi-perspective always makes things better. It always does. It's just mm. the way it is. Um, and all of us uh, in the arts, whatever role we're playing, you know, whether we are producers or policymakers or we're, um, we're assembling, whether we're, 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 we're assembling uh, groups, right? Because in essence, the performing arts is um, about collaboration. So I think we can be conscious about who we invite to the table. And I think if we, if we look at each seat as a very carefully, I think then, then we would be making choices. Because if you make the right choices and you put, you put people that challenge you creatively and, um, and who offer different uh, uh, points of view, walks of life, you know, um, it's going to make for uh, stronger work. It's, it's, it's going to be much more healing in ways that uh, we can't even predict. Um, mm. so, so that's sort of what we all need to, to consciously do. Mm, mm, mm. Wow. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we're getting a lot of question about um, greater diversity, a hunger for greater diversity in casting greater hunger for diversity in storytelling. Um, questions too about the audience. I mean, do you feel um, one person asks that you're playing to a kind of um, converted audience that is a, a slightly upper middle class audience in many of the shows uh, that, that you present? Or do you feel that you're reaching a greater range of audience that you've never touched before? Um, it is quite interesting because uh, um, I do think that part of um, creating a more uh, uh, diverse theatre industry is also creating a more diverse audience. Um, it's really important. So um, it's it's a learning curve for the audience too to also um, see a more diverse uh, uh peopling of the theatre as well. So what we as, as industry players want to do is to be able to show more diverse people in the theatre and make it a comfortable space where we don't lose the audience that we already have, mm -hmm. um, but we also make it a more inviting place for more diverse audiences to come in and see their stories being told. Yeah, and, and Natalie, I mean, would you say that SIFA, for instance, has a, an audience that's all too knowing about the arts, and that there's an audience that might be getting missed out in the, in, in, as a result? I have a lot of faith in, 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 in what artists do, because I think artists make uh, from a very um, innate place. So, um, and, 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 and if you are making, um, and I think if you, if you, if you look within, if you, if you sit at, at a table, you have a conversation uh, with an artist that, that feels really, uh, that defines their, their work as, as something as being, uh, being not having sort of the, the, the stage, you know, just kind of dismantling the stage, being on the ground with people. Um, 
I think that they, they have no other choice of making except that because that's how they're innately driven to create, you see. Mm. And I think a, a festival like SIFA uh, or any international arts festival, that's the beauty of it because I think we, 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 we are, we are, I think that a lot of art making is, is, is just when we are creating as artists, we're, we're, we're creating in a certain way. We're, we're, we're tapping on our own impulses. You know, we have our own, um, inclinations, artistic inclinations, and our perspectives are very, uh, you know, they belong to us. But, but on a festival platform, this is a place where you're really actively seeking out um, artists who will create in ways that will diversify the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think if you're, if you're consciously thinking of that, which is what every, which is, that's the, that's the place of a festival. And that's why uh, in my position as a, as a festival director, it's very different than my uh, position as a maker, right? Uh, it is, uh, my position is to facilitate uh, and to bring in and, and, and how to diversify the audience. The answer is in the artist that you, that, you, that, you, that you bring to the narrative of the festival. Uh, and they will, and if you support that, you support their vision, then I think you will create a, a more diverse uh, audience. Mm, yeah, great. Where, uh, where do you th see, uh, do you get around and see pockets of theatre across Singapore outside of the profession? Uh, somebody asked a rather good question about amateur theatre and whether or not the diversity shouldn't be starting there so that audiences are more demanding about what they see or even expect from their professional counterparts. Uh, is that something that is within your orbit as you plan a festival, as you plan even a season in a theater, Tracy and Adrian? Um, I guess, uh, I think that uh, um, when you're looking in terms of amateur theater, I don't think it's necessarily um, in our purview when we're looking at the work that we're doing. Um, I think that uh, amateur theatre has its own journey. They've got their, their, their own goals that they're trying to meet. Um, it's, they're trying to uh, uh, create a world for, for people who love theatre and want to take part in it. Uh, um, you know, but it's a very, it is a very different journey from um, what we're going, what, what we're doing as, as a professional theatre company. But I mean, it's, it's a very important part of the wider ecosystem of, of, the, of the industry. Um, um, and, you know, the, the, they are often the launching pads, if you like, or the, the, the first taste of theater that anyone might have a chance to, to, um, to partake in and I mean certainly with my my own journey I mean that's that's where I started you know and you know and do, doing amateur dramatics in in school and then you know even in, in university um which all just kind of fed my my need to pursue this um you know <laughs> as, as a as a so-called career mm -hmm. um but as actually interestingly enough as as um as Natalie was saying earlier, I mean, you really, really have to want to do this, to do this and this only. If there's any other thing in your life <laughs> that you are good at, that you enjoy doing, and that you possibly can make a decent living doing, if there's anything else, oh, for God's sakes, do that instead. Because, because you only want to choose this path if this is the only damn thing you can see yourself doing. Well, I think the pandemic has leveled all careers, so we're all in about the same place. <laughs> Natalie, with, with obviously with the festival, community is a, a key element. You've mentioned in many chats I've had with you leading up to this, um, the idea of community. You're really looking at communities. How does the community translate to you in terms of other other communities other than a say a professional community i think it i think um i think it stems with you know education right and i think that um and 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 learning we are 
we're lifelong learners. That's what we are as people. I think, uh, I think the thing that, 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 um, that helps a person, you know, wake up uh, um, to, uh, to kind of meet the challenges of a new day is, is if you have something new to learn. Right, and I think that that education is at the heart of it. And I think that um, if we, and I think our communities actually begin um, uh, in in that space where we're, where these little people, <laughs> these little people, are a diverse community, and 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 schools, I think, educational arenas um, are are sort of worlds where um, communities are forming and thoughts are forming. And I think that education is in essence uh, what is going to imbue every single person. That's what in essence, ideally, you know, a festival, a national festival is there for. It needs to touch. It's there to touch everyone. It's there for everyone. I mean, it can't be everything for everyone all the time, but, but, but that's, that's, that's the ideal. That's the goal. That's that's what we're reaching out for. To to that 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 the arts is essential, and that art makers um, and people who dedicate the, themselves to reaching out and communicating and and um, and articulating difficult things. Uh, this is essential uh, to who, a kind of a possible uh, harmony and when I say harmony it's not a kind of a cheap harmony but a, a deep understanding uh, a, 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 an opportunity to step out of oneself you know so so I feel like um, that that's where it needs to, to start we need to be listening to the different communities we need to be identifying the different communities um, and we and we need to be respecting uh, what a community, whether it's an amateur society or whether it's a, um, a, a youth-based youth -based organization, whatever it is, I think there's just, there's such a wealth uh, to learn, to tap on, to, to uh, grow from, to mine. So... Um, yeah, we're finding, yeah, I'm, I must tell you all uh, and the audience out there that Obviously, I'm uh, responsible for a very large uh, theater program, musical theater program, performance program, music programs. And we're finding worldwide now that urged on by the pandemic pop in part, but mainly from Black Lives Matter and uh, injustices done towards women, that students are revolting uh, against the way they've been trained in the past, which has sometimes been very authoritarian, uh, very male dominated, uh, that sensitivities have been abused, uh, liberties taken, um, and we're finding more and more that what we've got to do is to safeguard, uh, safeguard spaces, safeguard the student experience, um, and the whole idea of intimacy training has now come more and more into what's happening in schools. There's been a recent revolt in the UK at several drama schools um, with racist claims at uh, the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts, no less, and the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama, and also in Australia at the National Institute of Dramatic Art, NIDA. So these issues have started to come up and we have to face them. And I imagine even in the profession, intimacy is now becoming more and more a watchword with professional companies having intimacy policies. Film companies now have intimacy coaches on their sets to safeguard the rights of the actors. Is, is that something you see happening in Singapore? Has that come up in your conversation with actors and company meetings and so forth? Absolutely. Tracy and Adrian. Yeah, Adrian. Tracy, go ahead. No, I, absolutely. Uh, um, you know, I think uh, I, we, we do have an intimacy policy within the company. Um, you know, when we we have done plays that require intimacy within actors, um, I think uh, it starts from day one. And by day one, I mean the audition. So when you're in the audition and you're talking to the actor, we have to, to talk to the actor about 
what the script requires uh, um, and how comfortable they are with that. I mean, that has to be the first step. Are you comfortable even, even taking part in this storyline? Um, I think it's really important. It's important that the actor um, has a say as well. Um, so when we have done uh, uh, performances that require a certain amount of, of, of intimacy, we, we have a very specific journey that we take through the rehearsal process um, that makes sure that, that both partners are comfortable at every stage of the way. And it's, and it's a choreography. It becomes a, chore a learnt choreography and there is no de deviation from that choreography. Um, you know, and I think it's, it, it's really important it's really important. You cannot take advantage of somebody just because they are in a business where they have to, you know, perform uh, um, certain intimate storylines. Yeah, very good. Natalie, is that, is that an instance that's come up in Cake Theatre in particular? Oh, no, certainly. I mean, I think it's, it's always about creating uh, safe spaces. And um, so... It begins at you know with with and sometimes it it, it means working through uh, some some things that are that might be uncomfortable right uh, but but you have to build a safe environment and um, and 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 that's in, in in essence I mean I echo a lot of what uh, Tracy is saying you know um, yeah. that it's that professional safe environment that then makes uh, that allows you to then um, understand uh, uh, why you're making a choice to do something or, and, 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 and to feel, and to feel empowered in, 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 in even something that makes you ultimately uh, feel very vulnerable, right? Uh, but you have to find, if you can find uh, a kind of an empowerment in that, then, then you own that moment, you know? You own that moment, even if it seems like that it's making you the, the most vulnerable, uh, but, but vulnerability can be the most powerful thing in the theater. So we have to build these spaces so that, so that uh, this, um, so that chaos and uh, deep vulnerability can emerge on that stage, on that space. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I think we're going to move, if uh, you wouldn't mind now, to this last Menti board. Uh, which is going to pop up uh, magically as I'm speaking. And there it is. Uh, wow, you've got to actually read through these now. <laughs> and you, uh, as I understand it, is these are all the questions that have come in as we've been speaking and trying to field them in such a way that we could combine them. This is the audience's feeling about our topic and great. Wow. Minority languages and culture, raising awareness of the importance of diversity and inputting more diversity to the arts scene in Singapore. There is a real strong feelings. And we didn't need the cancel Hamilton uh, controversy to start these feelings. They're in the they're very strongly ingrained in the society. I mean, it's very obvious that we're, we're you know, as a, as, a, as a global community, let alone here in Singapore, we're, I mean, we're, we're all going through a, a huge cultural uh, shift. And uh, I guess, you know, a, a questioning of our own legacies and, and, and histories and uh, what our purpose is, you know, generally speaking. And, and I think right now we are all developing brand new touch points and, and trigger points and sensitivities uh, which perhaps wouldn't have emerged five, ten years ago. Um, and I think theatre 
is an avenue and a platform for us to all kind of address these these touch points and and and, and trigger points. Um, um, and I think you know we're all learning. Even as theatre makers, we're all learning along this along this journey. We might not, as I said earlier, we might not have all the answers, but we <laughs> we certainly have a hell of a lot of questions. Um, which hopefully are articulated through through the work that we are we're all trying to do yeah i know the work and the work speaks for itself and i know the work speaks for itself for all of us at whatever level we're working at in the theater uh, i want to thank uh really my uh wonderful panelists uh natalie adrian tracy for uh joining us tonight uh and also give thanks uh, to the uh, american embassy and its staff for arranging this event um they're going to show the results of uh, the other polls we've done uh, right uh, as, as we speak and go along. Uh, but it's a really important thing. And, and the open-mindedness they've shown to are speaking uh, quite forthrightly about many things and allowing audiences to speak forthrightly is, is much appreciated. So thank you very much. One thing I also wanted to mention, as far as we can, the embassy is hoping to make uh, a, a tape of this uh, available to audiences and they will give uh, some online hints I think about where you can write to for that. We've also put together uh, a list of readings for those who are interested in the question of race and diversity uh, and also readings related to Hamilton. There's not only um, the play itself but there's Ron Chernow's biography upon which the play is based. Um, also biography, a recent biography of Hamilton's wife, which is uh, very, very interesting indeed, and Hamilton's own writings. And we put together a bunch of YouTube references about Hamilton, which you would probably enjoy seeing. Uh, so all that's coming your way and all that is, is available for those who want them. So I think at this stage, um, uh, are we showing any more on the screen? Yes, no, maybe, okay. All right, so uh, I think the embassy probably has uh, run through everything it's going to run through. But I wanted to thank uh, Natalie Henningay, uh, Adrian Pang and Tracy Pang for joining me. And I wanna thank you, the audience, uh, for your questions, many of which we weren't able to answer, but we wanted to shoot as many of them on the screen at the end. So with that, thank you and good night. Thank you. Thank you.